Hey, good day, everybody. Uh, this is the Economic Impact of COVID-19 from Northwestern University's Economics Department, featuring Marty Eichenbaum and Matthias Dupke. I'm Mark Witte, the Director of Undergraduate Studies for Economics, and I'd like to give you a little background on our two speakers today. So Matthias Dupke is the HSBC Research Professor uh, in Economics at Northwestern University. He's a consultant to the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and he's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and many more things. But in the interest of time, I'll move on to Marty Eichenbaum, who I will similarly uh, diminish, but uh, he's the Charles Moskos Professor of Economics at Northwestern University. He's the an advisor of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. He's a board director for the Bank of Montreal and has many other important roles in the field. Uh, so uh, we're all very interested in what's happening with COVID-19 to our society. And at a certain level, I, I hear a lot from economists and I kind of imagine epidemiologists saying, Hey, economists, stay in your damn lane. Um, but you know, that's uh, that's what economists do. They're, we're fairly uh, fairly imperialist into barging to other fields, and you know, just imagining. Well, absent a breakthrough with vaccines, the factors that are most going to affect us in you know, in terms of this disease will be about how humans behave, and human behavior at scale is what economists do. Now, again, economists, we've always been very imperialist and barging into other fields, and probably nobody more so than Gary Becker, who is Matthias Dopke's thesis advisor. And one of the fields that Becker uh, innovated for, the field, for economics was the economics of the family, and a lot about specialization and uh, a sort of matching and things like that. And Matthias Dopke is uh, one of the great uh, sort of standard bearers in the Becker approach to the economics of the family, but he's also a, a macroeconomist, which no offense, Matthias, that seemed weird to me. Like what is economics of the family, which I think is as micro as you can get, have to do with the macro economy, which was the whole, you know, the whole economy. But, you know, it became clear to me after looking at your stuff that of course, like families derive, drive almost all of our decisions about like, you know, what to consume, how much to work, how much to save. And, the way you put the economics of the family at the center of your macroeconomic analysis is sort of that's the driver of it. I really think that's got to be one of the most exciting innovations in how macro is being done now. Now, how are you going to tie in COVID-19 to the role of the family? I, well, that's anybody's guess. Um, other speaker today is Marty Eichenbaum, and I'm sure he'd want credit given to his Nobel Prize antecedents, Tom Sargent, Chris Sims, and Ed Prescott. Um, Marty Eichenbaum was described by Noah Smith, an economist who writes for Bloomberg, as the, the dean of macroeconomics. And Marty is one of the most cited active researchers in macroeconomics. Um, and uh, he's sort of with his co authors, Larry Cristiano, uh, Sergio Rebello, and many others, defines what great macroeconomics is today. And his work in tying in COVID 19 to the macroeconomy is, well, it's just an outstanding use of one of the most important tools in economics, marginal analysis, that um, you know, in, in everything we might want to do, we could do more and there's probably a little benefit from doing more. But we might also want to do less because there's a cost to anything we do. And so you'll hear people making you know, both arguments, oh, we should do more because there's, there'd be a benefit to doing more and we shouldn't do so much because it's costly. And, and yeah, Marty just makes this beautiful, uh, beautiful economic argument about, you know, we have to be smart about this, that we have to match where the benefit is equal to the cost. We're on the margin. We want to do everything where the benefit exceeds what the cost of society would be. And if we don't do that, if we do too little, then that's a terrible social loss. But if we do too much, then the cost is ridiculous. And, and doing too much, well, we get a lot of pushback to the point where people just don't listen to whatever policy we're putting forward or the rulemaking process breaks down and we don't even get minimally useful uh, rules. And so, yeah, so um, I think the tools of economics are extremely important here. And Matthias and Marty have found ways that will be extremely helpful uh, as we implement them going forward. Uh, all right, so uh, I would like to hand off to, uh, who, who's starting first, Marty? Yeah, I think so. Well, please take away Marty Eichenbaum. Well, first of all, let me thank uh, Mark for his very gracious introduction. 
and I'm going to share my slides. If someone could just tell me if I'm doing that correctly. So are we seeing slides correctly? Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, it's always great to uh, reconnect with uh, the community, the Northwestern community. Um, today is a somber topic. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit uh, work of the macroeconomics of epidemics so based on joint work with Sergio Robello, who Mark mentioned, and um, younger co-author Matthias Tremont, who is uh, at uh, Freiburg University. So to put things in context, um, the initial response of most governments uh, to the COVID uh, epidemic was to implement what uh, we have called very simple containment measures, by which I mean measures that did not discriminate between ba people based on their health status. And as has become self-evident, uh, those policies imply a very sharp negative trade-off uh, between the level of economic activity um, and the health consequences of an epidemic. So uh, there really are two outstanding challenges uh, that uh, we face. Uh, I'll focus more on one, but I'm sure in the question period, other questions that with the second challenge will come up. The first challenge is really to design what I call politically sustainable, quote, smart health policies that minimize the economic cost of, 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 of the recession associated with, with COVID. And the second challenge is what a number of people are calling uh, a bridge. We have to bridge the COVID crisis. This presumes that the people that are out there are not becoming less smart or less able or less technical. The businesses are not innately less productive in the long run, but if we kill them in the short run, uh, they won't be there when this thing is over. And um, in so doing, in building that bridge, the, the challenge is um, to balance inefficient job losses, which will surely occur, but the appropriate sectoral reallocation that ought to occur in response uh, to, uh, to, to, the, to the COVID uh, problem. Uh, Mark mentioned uh, epidemiology models, and of course they are widely used to predict the course um, of, of, of the epidemic. And I have an enormous respect for those models and certainly agree they're very useful, but what they don't do is allow for the interaction between people in the sense of rate uh, economic decisions um, and rates of infection. So uh, the, the bottom or the, the beginning point from our work is that an epidemic causes a recession as people consume and work less to reduce the chances of getting infected. They're scared to put it in plain English and they take the appropriate reactions. That's one ch channel. But of course, the amount that people consume and work influences the rate at which infections spread. So the absence of those interactions limits the usefulness of forecasting uh, of, of epidemiology, pure epidemiology models for uh, forecasting and policy analysis. And that's what Mark was referring to. Uh, the, the economists have sort of jumped into the fray and have tried to extend those models and, and use them in ways that bring people back into the uh, calculus. So the, what makes the COVID to an economist, leaving aside humanitarian issues, which of course are first and foremost, but it's a very unusual shock to the economy. What do I mean by that? Well, you were all undergrads um, and you know, we talk about the shocks to demand, shocks to supply. What's really very unusual about COVID is it has both aggregate demand and aggregate supply effects. Very unusual. Uh, what's the supply effect? Well, that's pretty obvious people, you know, the epidemic exposes people who are working to the virus and they react to that risk by reducing their labor supply, right? It's, it's the right thing for them to do. But it also has an effect on demand uh, because the epidemic exposes people who are purchasing consumption goods to the virus and people react to that by reducing their consumption, right? Just look at the airlines. So, but now if you think about a negative shock to aggregate supply and a negative shock to aggregate demand, they work together to generate a large persistent recession. 
right? That severe recession would occur even if the government didn't institute any containment policies whatsoever. And there is actually now growing evidence that while containment certainly has an effect, um, most of the recession or a substantial part of the recession that we see would have happened without those containment policies. And there, Raj Chetty has done outstanding work. Um, uh, 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 I'm happy to give people references uh, to other papers, Chad Syverson and, um, and uh, Austin Goolsby. So that turns out to have a lot of important implications uh, for policy. So in the quote, typical recession, what do we do? Uh, we wanna boost demand, right? That's, you know, Larry Christiana may have taught you about increasing, you know, uh, uh, government spending or cutting taxes, but that's certainly not what you wanna do in the middle of a COVID epidemic. We really don't want United being full of planes. We don't want restaurants being jam packed. We don't want bars being completely packed uh, and people doing what they normally do. Now, what is the basic issue? Why would you want the government involved at all? Well, there's a classic externality involved in my working or my going to buy stuff. Uh, people with the virus don't fully internalize the effect of their consumption and work decisions on the spread of the virus. And the best analogy one a journalist, I was trying to explain this to you, said, oh, you mean it's like pollution? And I went, that's exactly right. When you go drive your car, you don't internalize the effects that you have on the environment. And so what does society do? One response is to impose what we call a so-called Paguvian tax, which is to tax things that are causing externalities. That would suggest then that they, and you may find this paradoxical that we want to tax in the middle of the epidemic or discourage people uh, from going out and doing all the things that they normally would do. Well, so the government, you know, most governments first did this brute force thing that we call simple containment measures. They said, we're going to have a complete lockdown, not just if you're uh, sick, not just if you're old, not just, you know, none of that conditionality, they just shut everything down. And that turns out to just have this very, very, um, have a very dramatic and painful uh, effect um, uh, on, on, on the economy. Um, and even though it caused a horrible recession in our models, the kind of models that Sergio Rebello and Matias and I have talked about, it uh, makes the recession worse, but it actually does raise welfare. Why does it raise welfare? Well, there's a marginal this and a marginal that. The marginal cost is the pain of an economic decline. The marginal benefit is reducing death, right? That's a big marginal benefit. Now, smart containment, which is a word that we use, does condition on what you do by health status. And there are lots of ways in which you could condition on health, uh, whether a person is infected or not, tracing, Fernando Alvarez has done great work on that and of course age. And the nice or uh, important thing about smart containment is that you get a smaller recession as I'll show in a model and fewer deaths that occur under simple containment. So simple containment is better than doing nothing, but you can do a hell of a lot better or a heck of a lot better with smart containment. Now you might say, well, testing, gee, isn't that expensive? Uh, it is, um, but the social return is enormous. So one way of thinking about the potential benefits of testing is that COVID is costing the US economy, roughly speaking, $80 billion a day. That's a number that comes from Larry Summers. So just to say that again, the, the COVID infection is costing us $80 billion in lost goods and services a day. Um, the US has spent about $5 trillion on various fiscal measures. Right, we, we go back to that in the question asked, but a tiny percent of that has been on COVID investments. Uh, according to Summers, less than 2%. Uh, it's hard to imagine a higher rate of return activity when uh, you're spending 80 billion bucks a day on, on, uh, on, on COVID. So yes, testing is expensive, but um, uh, we'll see some of the returns to that. Okay, so let me get to the SIR macro model, the standard epidemiology models, which is associated with the, the key point about the 
what epidemiologists do is there's essentially exogenous transition between health states, right? So you have a population that has four groups, susceptible people, they haven't been exposed to the disease, infected, they've contracted the disease, recovered. And for today, I'll assume that once you uh, survive, you get immunity that's permanent. That's not at all clear, but let's just not to make things complicated and deceased, the people who have died from the disease. Now, where we come in is to say, well, you know, that's a great story. That's a great beginning point, but people interact in goods and labor markets. And in the kind of work that we've done, there are <clears throat> new infections that arise from three types of social interactions. Uh, one are sort of non-economic social, social interactions. It might be your church. Uh, it might be saying hi to your neighbor, just living with your family. But then there's consumption-based activities and work-related activities. And susceptible people can become infected as a result of those activities. And critically, we're going to assume that people, you know, somewhat heroically, roughly understand that going to <coughs> a rock concert or a bar increases the probability of getting infected and they react uh, to that uh, probability. <coughs> Um, in the model itself, there's lots of bells and whistles, and we're obviously not going to go through that, but we have to take stand on infection probabilities. How risk averse are people? How do people react to risk? What evidence do we have for it? Constraints on the medical system, uh, you know, as it gets overwhelmed, dramatically raises the probability of death. And very critically, people react to the possible future arrival of vaccinations and treatments. So you take that kind of a model, and what I have graphed over here are, uh, looks like a pretty complicated model, but there are two lines here. One is the benchmark model, which is essentially an epidemiology model where people um, uh, are, re that model is modified so that people react uh, to what is, is, is the probabilities of death. And what I wanna point out to you in the blue model is that infections naturally arise, but even if the government did nothing, Notice this blue line over here says that aggregate consumption and output would fall in any event. So it would fall regardless of whether the government said we're having a lockdown or not. Now, when we first looked at these numbers, and these are weekly numbers, so you want to think about the average decline as being, you know, say 10%. We were first really nervous and said, gee, that seems really extreme. Well, in retrospect, that's not extreme at all. Now, what we have over here with the so so-called optimal containment policy is the government comes in and says, um, we are going to put the quote optimal tax, okay, that does the costs and benefits where you're maximizing people's welfare, taking into account the infection externality. One measure of that tax is if you translate it literally into a tax as opposed to laws, it would be equivalent to a 40% tax on consumption that then rose to almost 80%, just to give you a magnitude of the, uh, the tax. And notice it jumps to 40% right away. Why? Well, the government really wants to save lives because that vaccine may be coming. So you really want to do that. Now, of course, the externality in these models is larger as more people are infected. That's how we've uh, put this. And so the tax tracks the infection peaking at about you know, this number and then starts to decline. Notice that what simple containment does is it makes the recession worse. So this dotted blue line is below the solid blue line, okay? Why would a government want to do that? Well, for that, you have to go over here and say, what's happening to infections and deaths? Because you're clamping down on market activity, you are reducing the number of infections and that translates into an enormous savings in terms of uh, lives. And that's what you see by comparing the dotted line and the solid blue line. Now, we all know that the, in reality, the cost of inducing such a large recession, which by the way, is about the size of the one we're seeing, I'll come back to the numbers in a minute. Um, there's enormous social pressure to let go uh, of that optimal policy. 
to prematurely exit and reduce taxes. What this is a simulation of the model says, well, what do you get when you do that? Well, the only thing I'm gonna show you is this thing over here, which is as if at this point along the optimal path, you go, what the heck, you know, we're just, it's too big a price to pay. Then in fact, yeah, you're gonna get a short-term bump in consumption, like the July recovery, but then the infection is gonna to start to kick in again, okay? And you're just gonna land up having a contraction again as people react to the increased risk. So this simulation of the model, I think captures very much political reality or the cost of giving in to a premature release of containment. Yes, you will buy a short run kick in economic output, but the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the cost will be much larger deaths, right? So that you're paying, a, getting very little in return for all of these deaths, a very short run uh, kick in economic activity. Now, what about testing? All of that previous optimal containment policy just said, look, we're just gonna treat everybody the same. And the question is, could we do better than the kind of brute force, simple containment policy that we've talked about? Well, modeling that turns out to be complicated. And you can see right away that implementing the policy I'll talk about would be difficult, but it's this is aspirational. So you can imagine that two scenarios, the government tests some percent of the population that hasn't been tested. So you're testing more and more of the population, ramping it up. And in simple containment now, I have in mind that infected people, if the test identifies that you're infected, you don't work, but the government gives you consumption and we don't isolate you from non-economic social interactions, okay? So you're essentially removing those people from the marketplace, but not from social interactions. With strict confinement, you go one step further and you say, not only can you not engage in market interactions, I'm also literally gonna confine you the way, for example, in Israel, if you come in on a plane now, uh, you're going to a government hospital, a government hotel, and you're gonna be there for uh, roughly two weeks. Now, the gains to that kind of, a, those policies are enormous. So what this shows you is a version of that model in which you have model, so this is a model where basically we don't do anything. So that's the blue line. That's kind of what you saw a couple minutes ago. Here's a model with testing and smart containment. And when I first showed this, I remember talking to this with my family and I said, you know, what if you just test people, but don't quarantine them at all? Well, if you were strictly an economist, what you'd say is, oh, that's gonna make things much worse. If I know I'm infected, I'm already infected. So what the heck, I'm going to that restaurant. I would actually make things worse. So I'm not displaying that there. Everybody told me at the dinner table, I was just being an idiot economist. Um, I'm feeling very good about that prediction, but very bad about people when I see what's happening with bars, et cetera. They're exact, acting exactly like the model would predict, right? Um, in any event, let me leave that aside. With smart containment, you can see that you get a much smaller reduction in economic activity compared to the blue line, which is what you get in the equilibrium, right? So notice these are much better numbers than we saw before and you're getting less death. So that's a win-win. In fact, if you had complete containment, maybe what we're calling strict containment, the impact of the crisis would be much, much small. Essentially it would be pretty, not, not, I wouldn't say trivial, but you would be talking about this dotted line and this dotted line. So the more clever, the more testing and quarantine that you do, uh, you would basically catch the infected people, quarantine them, and that would have minimal uh, social consequences. Um, and so even the cost of setting up such a system, while they're obviously very substantial when viewed against the gains, both in terms of the economy and in terms of death would be very large. All right, so now for the scary part, where do we stand now, given the policy that we haven't done, right? We haven't done anything like that. So this is a picture of US economic booms and busts going back to 1882. These little funnel clouds are NBR recessions. And what I draw your attention to is this 
point over here. This is how we did last quarter. These are annualized rates. So as you can see that, you know, that's basically you take something multiply by four to get it to an annual number. This is by far the worst quarter we have had in American history, by far, right? I ask you to measure that relative to what might have been had we um, uh, adopted a policy uh, of either smart containment or strict containment with testing. So this is pretty bad. Um, what about looking forward to the future? Um, here, you know, economists are not always great at predicting. This I took from the conference board. And as you can see, what all these institutions are doing now are, you know, benchmark scenarios, um, uh, uh, intermediate scenarios, and uh, what happens if we don't get things under control next quarter. This is optimistic. Right, so this minus 7.2% for the year, right? If you look at the IMF, they say it's gonna be worse. I frankly think the numbers will be worse. What will happen next year? Obviously depends very sensitively on what you think about the, about the vaccine, quarantine, containment, et cetera. Uh, but the days of a V-shaped recovery, no one uh, quite believes in anymore. Uh, I will conclude with two points. One is, Debt. Um, debt has exploded worldwide as we have tried to build this bridge over the COVID recession. You can see that in the United States, one way to think about what's happening in the US, here's a time series. The debt to GDP ratio is about 106% after World War II. The debt to GB GDP ratio, according to the Congressional Budget Office, under a reasonably optimistic scenario, is about 107%. So now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? We can talk about that later, but if you think of COVID as a war, then maybe this is not such a bad thing. And the question becomes, are we incurring the debt for the right reasons? Are we spending it in the right reasons, et cetera? But this is a pretty scary uh, number by, by, any historical, by any historical measure. Let me conclude because I know I'm running a little bit close to time limits here, which is to say, the way to end the COVID recession really is to control COVID. There really isn't a choice of, we can do some magic thing to the economy without doing anything with respect to COVID. And that challenge then is to design politically sustainable, smart health policies that minimize the cost of the recession. I personally believe the testing is critical to that. We must test and identify infected people and quarantining them. Um, the fact is the current political reality is it's not gonna happen. I don't see any scenario where the political process will give us that outcome. And so sadly, what I think is what we're in a mode is we're hanging on until vaccines arrive. And in the meantime, we're gonna implement what my Israeli friends call an accordion strategy of opening up, shutting down, opening up, shutting down, which is hardly, uh, as I showed you before in the simulations of the model, not a particularly clever thing to do. Now, I'll just conclude with this and maybe we can come back to this. In the real world, recessions create inefficient job losses. Uh, we destroy firms in things that capital, the kind of capital that ongoing concerns um, uh, uh, accumulate. We destroy, um, unemployed people's capital who eventually become disengaged for the workforce. The trick is how do we put this all together? A, there are human uh, uh, issues, ethical issues, but even as a strictly economic point of view, we need to have some job sector reallocation. The plane industry will be smaller as we go forward. So we need people going from one sector to another, yet we have to balance that against the terrible and tragic uh, loss of human and human and firm capital, which will be the long run cost of COVID aside from the human tragedies. So I'll stop there. Thanks. And I will stop sharing. All right, uh, so I'll take over. Uh, Marty, thank you. Uh, thanks, Kayla, for putting this uh, whole event together.
Um, very excited to be able to talk about uh, this research and the current crisis. Thanks, Mark, for the uh, very nice uh, introduction. Let me share my slides. Okay, right now this is not connecting. Let me do it a different way. Hold on. This will be just a second. Okay, here we go. So, um, as Marty said, we find ourselves in the uh, middle of uh, the uh, worst recession since the uh, Great Depression uh, many years ago. Uh, it's a major economic crisis. It's also an uh, economic crisis that calls for policy responses. Now, Marty has talked about the central role of health policies, such as uh, testing uh, and tracing, and uh, that's something where we already doing a not a stellar job, but there's additional dimensions of policy that we also have to consider. For example, income support, you know, right now, uh, unemployment benefits uh, are expiring in the expanded form. A bunch of other uh, provisions are expiring. And so how are we going to continue supporting people in this recession is something that's coming up. The next thing that's coming up is a school opening. You know, in just a, a few weeks uh, left until schools are supposed to open and people have just now discovered that this is a big issue. And it's the next thing we have to decide. Is it uh, the right thing to send uh, kids back to school? What are the wider uh, implications of this? So uh, to, uh, to understand what the um, uh, right policies are, well, we have to understand how is this uh, recession different from other recessions uh, in the past? You know, one obvious difference is that other recessions had a different cause. Now we have a pandemic. We have a uh, uh, economic recession because of a health crisis, and that uh, in itself uh, has uh, implications for how the recession is different. Now, people, as, as Marty was describing very clearly, uh, people are, just, are uh, changing their behavior in response to the risk of infection, not just because they are told to, but also because uh, people do not want to get infected and therefore avoid certain interactions, certain economic choices that they would make in other times. And Marty and his co-authors have been leaders in bringing this health perspective uh, uh, into economic analysis uh, of recessions. But there's additional dimensions in which this crisis is different. And uh, one uh, aspect in which it's very different is apparent to every parent. Uh, one aspect that's different is that we're all now working from home and all the children are home as well because the schools are closed, the daycare centers are closed. And that has really changed uh, family life in a very profound way. Uh, every family uh, I know with children, you know, talks about uh, little else other than the challenges of uh, this uh, new and very changed life uh, uh, together of childcare and work duties uh, colliding and often being uh, uh, incompatible. Now, what this uh, hints at is that this recession is different also in the dimension of the impact uh, on families and in the impact uh, on gender. So we focus in particular on the role of uh, women who are uh, affected in a very different way from a regular recession. And uh, we argue in this, uh, in this paper with a few co-authors that this uh, also has uh, very important implications for how effective certain policies can be, for what this recession will uh, look like in terms of how deep it's going to be, how easy it, it will be to get out of it, and also what are going to be the long run repercussions of this uh, crisis. So uh, let me uh, start by saying that uh, an important contrast to regular recessions is that regular recessions, in fact, uh, hit men a lot stronger than women. So if you look at employment of men versus women over the business cycle, uh, here in this picture, you can see that a man's employment is a lot more volatile than a woman's employment. So, so black lines here are uh, men, the red lines are women. This is a deviation from a trend. So here, for example, is the uh, Great Recession after the financial crisis about 13 years ago. You can see that the black lines drop much uh, faster and much uh, further than the uh, red lines that uh, correspond to female employment. So, so men are much more affected. Uh, in fact, uh, this term man sessions has taken currency, uh, reflecting this reality that most recessions really affect men much more so than, than women. And it has some uh, you know, implications for how to deal with these crises. 
just a few months ago, for the first time in, uh, in uh, American economic history, women actually became the majority of the U.S. labor force. December 2019 was the first time that women were the majority of workers. But even though women are the majority of the labor force, they only account for about a quarter of labor fluctuations. So uh, over the cycle, usually female employment is a stabilizer. It is really not where the uh, large fluctuations come from. What we point out in our research is that uh, this is a totally different situation in this uh, current downturn in the COVID-19 recession for two different reasons. Now, the first reason is uh, which uh, sector, which uh, occupations are most affected by the downturn. In a usual recession, one of these sectors that crashes the fastest is construction. You know, people stop building houses and uh, factories. In a downturn, most construction workers are men. That's one example of men being very heavily affected. Uh, more women relatively are in sectors like education and healthcare that are less volatile over the cycle and therefore more stable. So a lot of the uh, impact in a regular recession comes from men just being in sectors where you lose employment quickly. Now, if you look at sectors in this recession, you'll see that the sectors that tanked the quickest and the, the furthest are high contact sectors where working implies talking to people at a short distance, things like uh, restaurants, uh, hotels, uh, a lot of uh, more uh, social sectors, uh, those sectors uh, went uh, down the fastest. In some cases, they almost disappeared. And those are sectors where many women work. So just in terms of the direct impact on layoffs, we have a much bigger impact on women this time. That's important. There's a second thing that we think is even more important, that is the childcare dimension. Schools shut down, uh, daycares shut down, kids are at home, and somebody has to watch those kids uh, right now. And it turns out that even grandma or grandpa can do it right now because we want to social distance uh, ourselves uh, from older people in particular uh, to risk uh, to lower the risk of infecting them. And so, uh, so the uh, fraction of childcare that's actually done by parents has increased enormously. It's just a whole different dimension from, from usual times. Now, this affects all parents. It turns out it affects women more so than men in part because there's many more single moms than single dads. So th that's the most direct example of this. But even among uh, married couples raising children together, women do the majority of childcare in most cases. And this also carries on in the crisis. And so we can see uh, in this crisis that uh, parents do uh, a tremendous extra amount of childcare across the board, but on average women do uh, an even larger increase uh, than men do. And so you can now see how this shows under the labor market. I'm just going to show one picture of this. So uh, this picture uh, compares the uh, impact on unemployment between uh, women and men. So it's the uh, difference between the rise in women's unemployment minus the rise in men's unemployment uh, from the uh, previous boom to the bottom of the recession. Okay? And so you see that uh, in usual recessions, uh, this is a negative number, meaning that women's unemployment goes up by less than by men's. Uh, conversely, the men are more affected. For example, in uh, 2009, the men's, the male unemployment rate went up by about 2% more than the women's unemployment rate. If you look at our current recession, the last line here, 2020, the COVID-19 recession, it is completely the other way around. So unemployment for women went up by about three percentage points more than for men, completely reversal of the uh, usual pattern. And this is the official unemployment rate, which doesn't even capture the entire impact. Now, because to be part of this unemployment rate, you have to be unemployed. So you have to have uh, been fired from some job. But what we observe is that many people stop working on their own accord because of those childcare needs. Now, because they have something else to take care of, they're unable to work, but they may not actually be formally uh, counted as unemployed. So in this recession, we have a larger drop in employment compared to the rise in unemployment. Okay, so that is uh, the pattern. The question is, how does it make the recession different? Uh, and what are the repercussions of this for how the economy will evolve through the crisis and, and beyond? And to do that, we build a, a macroeconomic uh, model, as Mark was saying, that's uh, one thing I specialize in, to uh, look at macroeconomic implications, but of family behavior. So this model takes uh, account of the uh, you know, different behavior of women and men in the labor market. It takes account of... Uh, family making joint decisions, and it takes account of childcare needs, uh, placing a large burden on uh, parents in this crisis. So all of these things show up in the model. And then we use this model to compare a regular recession, think of something like uh, what we had uh, 13 years ago with the Great Recession versus a pandemic recession that we're going through 
right now, a recession that is characterized by shutdowns where you have a decline in service sector employment and you have this huge increase in child care needs. So to show you some, some pictures that show you uh, how these outcomes are different, uh, first one is uh, maybe uh, you know, already very familiar. Uh, the pandemic recession is much deeper, so you get a much a larger decline in uh, total labor supply and total labor earnings, ultimately output in the pandemic recession, in part because the shock is bigger, but also because the uh, high childcare needs prevent many people from working the way uh, they would do usually. So this is something that we knew, you know, that the impact is uh, large in general. It is also asymmetric uh, by gender. So this uh, second uh, picture here shows you the uh, ratio of labor supply um, women versus men. So a higher number means uh, relatively more women are working, lower means uh, more women are dropping out. You can see here uh, the blue line is a regular recession. This is something like uh, what we saw in uh, 2007 to 2009. There you see that actually women's labor supply goes up. You know, and this is uh, in part because more men lose their jobs. Think of those unemployed construction workers. In part, this is also, this is important, reflecting uh, insurance within the family. You know, so one thing you observe in a regular recession is that some uh, women start working exactly because their husbands or partners uh, lost the job. You know, so you actually see uh, a rise in labor supply by uh, some married women in particular to compensate for this loss of income uh, for the fa family. So uh, women with their more stable employment uh, serve as something like a shock absorber to this economic shock for families in a regular recession because they have a less direct impact. But we see in the red line that in the pandemic recession, very much like what we see right now, the shock absorber is gone because the direct impact on women is so large. You know, so many are many more are fired than usual, uh, and even larger fractions unable to work because of increased uh, childcare needs. And this uh, drives down female employment uh, very strongly uh, compared to regular recession. Gives us this very different uh, uh, outcome compared to the uh, you know regular pattern that we have seen in recessions in the past. Okay, so so far we have seen this different impact. Now there's reasons, uh, mostly childcare, but also uh, sectoral distribution of shocks, why women and men are differently affected. Then the next question is, well, how does this matter? Now, how does this uh, affect the shape of the uh, recession? How does it affect the um, recovery? How does it affect policies uh, that we have uh, such a different pattern uh, in this recession? Of course, there's a direct welfare impact. You know? So there's a welfare impact of women from, from having uh, lower employment, uh, but there's uh, impacts that go uh, beyond that. Um, I think I'll skip these and go maybe straight to uh, this picture. So uh, if you think of the macroeconomic uh, impact, the one thing you always worry about in recessions from the macro perspective is how strongly shocks to income are transmitted to shocks uh, in uh, consumption and consumption demand. Now, if, uh, if some people get laid off and uh, have a loss in income, uh, but uh, because of this, they radically uh, uh, reduce their own consumption and buy less stuff. Uh, this means the shock will get propagated because this uh, becomes in a demand shock that's transmitted to additional uh, sectors of the uh, economy. So, so one question that's always uh, central to macroeconomic models of recessions is how strong are these shocks transmitted to consumption? As I was just saying, in a regular recession, we have this uh, shock absorber function of, uh, of families that often the spouse is able to compensate for some of the job loss uh, of the main earner in the family. And you can see this here. So here we are uh, plotting a labor supply of uh, a woman, a married woman in our model, uh, and we're focusing on women who, who were working part time before. They were in the labor force, but not working uh, 40 hours per week. And so you see that in the regular recession, uh, the blue line over here, the labor supply of those women actually goes up you know, because many of them increase the labor supply to compensate for this uh, loss of, uh, of income for the family. And so this is uh, one reason why families can compensate some of these losses. It is one reason why in a regular recession, the transmission from income to consumption is not that strong because this insurance mechanism is available. There's some help available inside the family. What we point out is that in the current COVID-19 recession, this is simply uh, not, not there. So there's a huge drop in labor supply for, for everybody, uh, in part because the impact on employment is more symmetric. You know, so you have uh, many more women who have also lost jobs, but even more so because all these couples are then weighed down by these childcare obligations. You have uh, children at home, they have to be looked after. Uh, it's just not possible to be as flexible as usual in supplying labor to the labor market. So very few families are able to uh, increase labor supply 
as a response to drop loss in the in the usual way. And this means that uh, insurance is uh, not available at the uh, usual level. So one number that we use in macro to uh, to uh, uh, to summarize this impact of income uh, on consumption is the marginal propensity uh, to consume, which tells you if you lose a dollar of income, say because of the uh, sh drop loss in a recession, uh, how much is your consumption uh, going to go down? So a high number means a, a, a very strong transmission from income to consumption. The blue line over here shows you the transmission from income to consumption into uh, in a regular recession. The red line uh, shows you the same thing for the pandemic recession. You see this much stronger uh, transmission uh, from income to consumption, the pandemic recession. It reflects that the shock is very big, but it also reflects that the family insurance uh, isn't there, that uh, families cannot play this usual role of absorbing some of those shocks. That makes the shock a larger and a lot more uh, persistent. Now, the fact that MPCs are large, you know, there's a good and the bad thing about that, because uh, high MPCs by themselves mean that a, a recession is likely to propagate and get bigger uh, on its own, and that, that's bad, you know, that gives you a, a bigger downturn. But it also means that policy can be very effective. If you have a very high MPC, uh, that means that uh, payments to households, if you give uh, income transfers, are very effective at raising demand because they're essentially starved for cash. They have no other insurance. So if you're going to give them some extra money, they're going to spend a large fraction of that. So that tells you that in this crisis, even more so than in the usual recession, it is very effective to provide income support to families. That, of course, you know, speaks to this current debates. Uh, is it a good idea to keep providing stimulus payments? Is it a good idea to have uh, uh, raised uh, unemployment benefits. You know, this says, well, if you think about uh, aggregate demand, this uh, does matter a lot on the downside if you cut these benefits off, uh, as might be happening right now, you know, the uh, drop in demand will be a lot more rapid uh, compared to a regular uh, downturn. Okay, so this is uh, you know, one of the main uh, macroeconomic implications. Um, there's not a ton of time, but I want to uh, also mention implications for gender inequality. Now, so the so one thing that happens if you lose a job in a recession as a worker is, uh, well, you lose income right then, but you tend to lose income, in fact, in the future also, uh, the income loss tends to be very persistent. And this is because even if you find another job after the recession, the job is probably not as well paid as the previous one. It may not be at the same stage of career. It may not be uh, putting you back on that same track that you were on before. So the uh, so recession job loss leads to very persistent earnings losses. Now, because we have this asymmetric effects on women versus men, that means it will also affect the gender wage gap. So we see after a regular downturn, because it hits men more than women, that the gender wage gap closes. You know, so, so women catch up to men in terms of wages. Uh, now we should expect to uh, see the opposite. We should expect to see a quite substantial widening of the gender wage gap, because this time the uh, uh, impact disproportionately hits women as opposed to men. So if you worry about gender inequality for the next uh, few years, there is uh, some reasons for pessimism uh, just because the direct Im employment impact uh, has been uh, so large. We do point out that if you think of the even longer run, there might be a, a bit of a silver lining. Now, why is it silver lining? Well, uh, you know, a big reason for why you have gender inequality in the first place right now is exactly this issue of childcare. You know, that for uh, women having children is still a much bigger impact on the labor market opportunities uh, compared to men because uh, their career opportunities shrink, uh, the flexibility of taking care of kids isn't really that high, the ability to do uh, demanding career jobs is, is, is not the same. And to some extent, this has to do with employers not being very flexible in accommodating having careers combined with children. To some extent, it's also a function of social norms inside families that many families still choose to uh, assign the majority of childcare to mothers, even if they happen to have higher wages, for example. And so, so those are things that hold back gender inequality. We argue there are some reasons to think that the current crisis might actually erode some of those barriers. Uh, one important one is uh, work flexibility. Now, right now, we are all uh, working from home. Kids are running around there. You know, you saw maybe my son uh, walk in here uh, a short time ago to ask for more time on his uh, iPad. So, uh, so we have now all uh, gotten used to this idea of being flexible in combining uh, work and family responsibilities. It's likely that some of this will stay. Now, even now, uh, many companies have announced that they will uh, keep working from home as a permanent option. That helps parents you know, because flexibility is valuable when you have to deal, for example, with a sick child at home. But because right now the burden of this uh, falls more on women, it will be uh, a beneficial element for gender inequality. 
There's also changes to social norms that might happen, but uh, I don't have much time, so I won't talk about those. But uh, bottom line is we conjecture over the very long term, uh, the crisis might actually give you social changes that will benefit women, but it will take a long time uh, to go there. Last thing I will show you is, uh, is uh, one uh, thing about policy. You know, one thing that you can uh, discuss in this kind of uh, context is uh, the impact of school closings or school openings. And so we look at this model to ask, well, if you were able to open schools uh, in a safe manner, how uh, would the impact of this be on the depth of the recession? So here you see uh, you know, in red, that's our regular pandemic recession. It's assumed here to last for a year and a half, essentially until you have a vaccine. The yellow line over here shows you what happens if you're able to uh, open schools, you know, send kids back to school and daycare uh, two quarters into that recession, pretty much where we are right now. So if you're able to do that, you immediately make the recession a lot smaller uh, just because you free up all these childcare needs. Now, right now we have uh, uh, almost a third of the workforce have a child at home. So, so they're impeded in some way by this high childcare requirement. Opening schools will be hugely beneficial for uh, getting the workforce back to uh, where it wants to be. Of course, very clearly, we're not saying this is an obvious thing to do because obviously it depends on the health consequence. If it's not safe to do this, if it makes the recession worse, uh, it will make, uh, uh, it will, if it makes the pandemic worse, it will make the recession worse. Uh, Marty was saying uh, completely correctly that you have to fight the health crisis uh, first. But it does speak to priorities. Now, if you have a priority uh, to uh, open schools and uh, do everything you can to make that possible, like some European countries have done, well, then you're able to get this kind of recovery. If you uh, prioritize opening bars and restaurants instead, and then get a level of infection that makes it impossible to open schools safely, well, that option is going to be gone. And so it does also speak to this uh, debate we have right now. We have maybe already run out of time, but uh, it certainly does suggest that uh, purely economically, not just economically, but also from the economic perspective, prioritizing schools over, say, bars and restaurants you know, would be uh, uh, just uh, uh, the wise choice to make. So that's a little overview of our work on this, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, talk more about some questions that came in. Thank you. Matthias, that was fantastic. I had no idea that the labor market had changed in those ways because of COVID. That's just what, what historic times. It is, it is historic times in many ways. Yeah, but in ways I hadn't even realized. Uh, so uh, we've got some questions from our, uh, our alumni out there. Uh, and so Marty, you'd raised the point of how much we've run up the debt. Uh, what do you think is the long run impact uh, of that on say GDP and inflation and sort of uh, what this sort of services government will be able to deliver in the future? Are you, you muted? Uh, uh, Marty, we're not hearing you. Yep, sorry about that. Um, terrific question. So let me start with two perspectives on that. Um, what is the danger or how do you think inflation could follow from all this debt? This really goes centrally to the question of central bank independence. Um, you really, What you really worry about is that at some point the economy starts to recover at that point, the Fed would start to like to raise rates. But, you know, it's one thing to cover a debt that's 107% of GDP when interest rates are, you know, 0.5 of a percent. It's quite another when they're 2% or 3% or 4%. So there will be a scenario where there's enormous pressure on the Fed to delay raising rates when they should be. So this is something down the line. Is this a pressing concern? Should this affect what we're doing now? Well, let me tell you how bond markets are voting, which are bond markets show absolutely no concern whatsoever with this scenario. So, you know, is it a logical possibility? Absolutely. Is it anything the markets seem to be concerned about now? Absolutely not. And if you don't believe me, check out the 10 year bond yield. And Mark, just to add to this, no, you, because Marty showed this picture of the historical evolution of the debt to GDP ratio, and uh, it, it's really, as you were saying, World War II is a bit of a precedent for what we're seeing now. You know? And uh, World War II was an example where the debt was ultimately paid down in part with inflation, not a hyperinflation, but we had higher inflation in the 50s. So a lot of this money ultimately uh, was uh, not paid back in real terms because the inflation rate went up. 
but it went up in a moderate way, not in a way that uh, crashed the economy. So, you know, it doesn't suggest it was a bad idea to take on this debt. Uh, it's just something that happened uh, later on. It may be a bit early to see if something similar might happen right now, but, but I fully agree there is uh, you know, no reason here to, uh, to be overly concerned about this uh, at, at this time. Although um, I, I worry that the post-World War II rundown of the debt to GDP ratio is not a good model for us because one, the inflation things you point out, Two, I read this book by Bob Gordon that I, I can't recommend strongly enough about how our likely uh, growth rate in the future is not going to be anything like it was post-World War II, at least partially because of the economics of the family uh, features where you know many more women took much higher roles in the economy that, that, than they did before. Well, there, there are definitely reasons to think it could be a problem, especially when you compare the interest rate the government has to be spending versus the growth rate of the economy, right? Um, and you're highlighting that the growth rate of the economy is likely to be lower than it was after World War II. I, you know, I, I hate thinking that bond markets um, don't think about this stuff, right? I mean, maybe mm -hmm. we have some folks uh, you know, amongst our alumni think a lot about this. It is absolutely striking um, that real interest rates have declined, nominal interest rates decline, and the idea that the social returns of investing when you can borrow at essentially 0% to keep families going, to do all the things that Matthias talked about and other things, seems hard to argue against right now. Hmm. All right. Um, I should add, we'll, we may go a few minutes over um, because we've got a lot of great questions here. And I also want to follow up on Matthias's point that Kayla Adkins made this all happen and uh, we're very grateful to her for all her help. Thank you, thank you. And to Christy. And Chris, yeah, Christy Anderson. Uh, so uh, that a number of people have asked about uh, the way European countries have responded to the COVID-19 in terms of supporting economic activity and supporting firms versus households and how the US has done it. And how do you think we have fared versus what uh, other countries have done? So, you know, one example is, is Germany, which is uh, where I'm from originally. And as you're alluding to, in Germany, they have a much more a widespread policy of um, uh, furloughs where the government replaces the wages. So, so firms don't lay off workers, but they essentially get the government to uh, pay a large fraction of the wage bill uh, while this uh, crisis is, is going on. And there was a bit of an attempt to do something similar with the uh, support program for businesses here, but for a limited period of time and not really at the same uh, scale. And what you see in the data, so if you compare the German versus US data, you see that actually the uh, recession is the same size. So the drop in GDP over the quarter, US, Germany is really very comparable. So the shutdown had very similar implications overall, but you have a much, much smaller rise in unemployment uh, in Germany. So those guys are still connected to their employers and they are essentially much more able to go back to uh, employment uh, uh, seamlessly compared to here. And, and that does matter, you know, because getting a new job after a layoff uh, uh, can be complicated. There's also in the US additional consequences like losing health insurance, which uh, right now, of course, matter, uh, matter quite a bit. So I think if you look at the uh, outcomes in the European countries, uh, it was uh, quite uh, successful, I would say, in terms of uh, uh, slowing down this impact on employment and perhaps uh, preventing some of these long run repercussions. And I should say, you know, Germany had this in the previous crisis. But some other European countries have not had this before. They also uh, uh, picked this up in just a few uh, weeks and months uh, in the middle of this crisis. So it's, uh, it's uh, certainly work, but it can be done you know, to uh, put a program like that into place, even on a short time scale. You know, let, I agree with virtually everything Matthias said, but let, let me just urge one little caution uh, on that. And, and that has to do with sectoral, the reallocation of resources across sectors. Um, the, the Europeans, as usual, have chosen stability, right? And, and that's a reasonable choice. The Americans have chosen to say, look, we got to get on with it. United, as, and I'm a <laughs> United slave, so to speak, but United needs to shed some employees. That tension is exactly what different countries are working through in different ways. And I, for me personally, it's hard to know uh, what exactly is the right balance quite yet. No. It's certainly a fine balance because you can also look at Europe and say that uh, places like France, Italy, Spain have this huge uh, youth unemployment, uh, 
which is uh, to some extent a consequence of trying too hard to uh, preserve existing structures and well, push exactly. against uh, structural change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I In the crisis, I would say it's a different situation, but yes, it's a, it's a balance you need to get right. Well, uh, somebody has a question I think follows up well with that. Uh, what do you think are the long run implications from this? Like after 2009, we basically got back on our feet and pushed up the capital requirements for the financial institutions and kind of went along as we did. Uh, will we get back to something normal or will there be long run striking changes? So this is a terrific question. Let me, let me take the lead in this because I've wrestled with this both as an academic and in sort of some private activities. Um, th there's two things every business leader has to ask him, him or herself, which is, do we think that we're going to a new steady state or are we just going to another steady state faster, the old one faster? When we have vaccines, and I, I think it's reasonable to think that we're going to have this, if we go up two, three years, will the world really be that different? Um, I don't think it will. I think what we will have is a realization there was a lot of fat in the system. We could have been doing things better. So universities could have been doing a better job of combining um, technology with in-person classes financial sector, which is something I know a little bit about, uh, we don't really need to do everything in person. Businesses don't need to have everybody showing up every day uh, and doing that horrible commute. So the answer is, I think in the end, my own vote is that this will be a shock that forces us to go where we were going faster. Social norms are, and that will have very important differences for some of the reasons Matthias talked about. Um, but I, I don't think the world is fundamentally different than it was five months ago. Yeah, it's, it's uh, hard to predict the future. And I think the uh, Great Recession makes you a little pessimistic you know, because then we thought we will never make these mistakes again of deregulating banks. And uh, 10 years later, we've all forgotten about this. It's no longer on the agenda. And so so there, there's, uh, I think, some reasons for pessimism. I do think it's such a big shock that uh, some things will come out of this. Now, I mean, I mean, one uh, example is just healthcare. You know, how important is it to have uh, healthcare that uh, covers a large tract of the population? I think after seeing the the huge variation in death rates uh, in this current crisis, I think it's just going to be higher on the agenda than it was perhaps before. Uh, for families, you know, the stuff that we work about um, the past uh, does show us that a big shock to uh, to family life uh, does have long run repercussions. Now, we talk a bit about. World War II being the other example of this. So, so World War II being the moment where for the first time married women joined uh, the labor force in millions. You know, and they were working in the factories to build uh, ammunition and planes. And many of them enjoyed the experience. That was really in, in many ways the uh, beginning of this uh, tremendous transformation of uh, nowadays uh, female and male labor force participation being very similar and most uh, married women working after having, after having children. So we can get these transformations uh, I think we see one of these uh, moments where family life is completely put on its head, uh, at least for a while in this crisis. And, and, and so I do think we'll see some social changes uh, coming out of this uh, in the future. All right, one last question from uh, some, some people following up on that theme. Uh, so Marty, you're talking about how some of the fat has been revealed in the system that will not be continued. Uh, where do you think this might appear in terms of say, changing um, locations? Like it'll shake up real estate markets, shake up, like do we have to do so much in New York City or Chicago? Um, how will it affect things like supply chains? Oh, Marty. Marty, you are muted. It's a terrific question. It's, um, you know, it, it's pretty clear that there are a lot of industries. So you have to go industry by industry uh, where you really can do a bunch of stuff at home. But it's all, and so productivity in the financial industry um, is actually in many ways gone up. But what you worry about, we're also seeing increasing fatigue. I mean, are we all gonna be working from homes in rural Vermont? No, we still have to meet in person. No, we still have to onboard. It's one thing for me with a 20 year relationship with Matthias getting on Zoom and talking about things, that's easy, but a new assistant professor, that's hard. A new employee, you have to culturalize him or her, et cetera. Uh, but the demand for space will go down. 
right? So if you ask me, what do I think will be happening to the price of commercial real estate? Uh, hmm. Other things equal, it seems to me it has to go down. Will it go to zero? Of course not. Um, we're always gonna need people meeting face to face. But you know, again, I, I go industry through industry. Universities um, really do a lot of things, I think, that we don't need to do. And we could do them smarter, we could do them better, and we could pass on some of those cost savings to undergraduates. Um, I'm, I'm sure other people have other examples. Airlines, hotels, do we really need to send executives hurtling through the air for 20 minute meetings? Um, I'll give one final example. My son-in-law who works for private equity realized he can work from anywhere and he's decided instead of working from San Francisco to work from Glencoe. So that's terrific. And that'll lower the price of housing in San Francisco and raise it a little bit in Glencoe. I think commercial and residential will be totally different you know, because commercial, it's clear, more people will work from home. So yeah. it's just a less demand for office space. We don't know exactly how much, but it's certainly, we know the sign, you know, the demand for office space will go down. In terms of residential, people are talking about that we're all going to be affected of uh, infection, but the reality is that you know, once we have the vaccine, people will forget about this. I don't think we're going to be always uh, worried about the next uh, pandemic. Uh, and I, I think the big trend that we have seen is that people live in the city not because that's where the jobs are, but because they like to live in the city. You know? so, so, so the reason that all these businesses are moving to downtown Chicago is not uh, because it's cheap there, but because that's where the uh, young tech workers uh, want to be, you know? because they want to be around uh, you know, the coffee shops, uh, the, the, the restaurants, the, the, the music. So it's really a quality of life. You know? And so this desire to be close to other people, to live in these denser areas, I'm sure that will come back. You know? so, so my expectation is that in terms of where people choose to live, that it's going to be cool to be in a city that's going to be just the way it was before, which is going to have more conversions of office buildings into cool lofts uh, for the next generation to move into. All right. Well, that's all the time we've got. But thank you both for putting this together. And thank you for giving me the the most hopeful things I've heard on the score in quite a while. Um, you've stimulated my brain. I'll be thinking about this a lot. And I, I hope everybody who tuned in, well, I wanna thank you for tuning in and I, I hope that you have the same reaction. Thank you all and to look forward to the next one of these. Thank you very much. Thanks Mark, thanks Kayla. Thanks everybody for 